with us here today. Um, it gives me great pleasure to in, um, introduce our speaker today, David Travers. Um, it's a fast-moving world that we live in, isn't it? So when this was um, all arranged in around November or December last year, um, Dave, David was Chief Executive of UCL, University College London's Adelaide campus. Um, we learnt, unfortunately, just a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago that the powers that be in London have decided to no longer um, continue with the campus in Adelaide. Um, and as a result, um, uh, uh, David, David is no longer the chief executive there. However, that means that he can uh, paint a much broader um, canvas today, as you would have seen from his uh, bio. He's not only the former CEO at um, the Adelaide campus, he had more than a decade in the state government, senior executive roles, um, and including four years in London as the South Australian government's deputy agent general. Um, he's worked extensively in Europe, the US, Asia, Russia, and the Middle East, leading government um, investment, um, or, uh, um, export and um, migration initiatives. Um, he's also had a lot of experience um, in uh, the offices of um, uh, politicians here in South Australia, both Graham Ingerson and also Jane Lomax Smith. Um, he's an alumnus of Harvard University, Flinders University, and a former Young South Australian of the Year. And um, he's got the very interesting and somewhat enigmatic um, title of what he's going to talk about is South Austra Australia, a three-letter acronym. So would you join me in welcoming David to the podium, please? Uh, Graham, thank you. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And I guess it's continuing on from Graham's introduction and apology that uh, I had decided some time ago, actually, to, to leave the university. And when the university decided it wanted to, to pull out in uh, three years' time, I figured now is as good a time as any, which does give me a little bit of latitude, but I don't intend to speak on education today. Um, the title of my speech, as Graham says, is South Australia a three-letter acronym, hardly lends itself to, to that kind of topic. But <coughs> instead, I want to focus on current events here in South Australia, um, particularly, you know, what the heck is going on? Um, I know it's fringe and it's mad march, and for those of you who are here in the crowd at Sunday's match, uh, India versus Pakistan, as I was with my 10-year-old son, that's kind of a crazy atmosphere for the sedateness of Ad Adelaide Oval. But, uh, you know, with Jay Weatherall announcing a review into the time zone and uh, establishing a royal commission to deal with nuclear and uranium, um, what on earth is going on, I might hear you say. Oh, and isn't South Australia, or SA, a two-letter acronym? So let's try and make sense of uh, all of these issues. We know, of course, South Australia's not a three-letter acronym. VIC or VIC or NSW, New South Wales or QLD, Queensland clearly are and, uh, and that isn't something that South Australia has been or really wants to be. But I think the really important question is how do we see ourselves uh, and, and what are we? Because there's a clearly a lot of activity going on and it's a, a defining point in our history. And I think you know, one of the questions I would pose to you is you know, how, do, how do you see yourself and how does the Rotary Club of Adelaide see itself? You know, it's a, perhaps a good place to start. Um, you know, do you have to be living in Adelaide to be a member of the Rotary Club of Adelaide? You know, was Gaul or Goolwa, was that okay? Does it matter? Um, I guess I think it does matter, but probably in a way that's different to what you think. I have this hypothesis that South Australia is in fact three things only. It's a political jurisdiction, a B-grade cricket team, and a half-hour time zone. And I don't know about you, but none of those three things excite me. Particularly if you put them all together, which I had the unfortunate situation of, of doing once. And it was 10 years ago, I was on a trade mission to India with the then Premier, Mike Ran, And uh, Ran decided it would be really, really interesting to play a game of cricket uh, with the Indians. And uh, so he challenged the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu to a Premier's 11 game. And he roped in the South Australian Special Envoy, a guy called Darren Lehman. You might have heard of him. <laughs> He's now the Australian cricket coach. And, uh, and I know Buff quite well from the Barossa days. He's my uh, godson's um, cousin from a, um, from a marriage. And so we were on the bus on the way to Shawpack Stadium in Madras, if you know your cricket. And uh, Buff says, um, OK, so who's played cricket amongst the delegates on this trade mission? And I look around, and the only member of the entire touring party of, uh, of delegates was a guy, he's probably a Rotarian from Tanunda, puts his hand up. So we've had two of us who've played cricket in our entire life. So Buff says to me, all right, David, you can, uh, you can be the wicketkeeper. So we get to the ground and there's seven TV stations. 
they've not only heard that Darren Lehman, who of course made his test, uh, test debut in Bangalore, is in town, but the Tamil Nadu Premier was clearly a little bit smarter and a little bit more competitive than our Premier, and uh, he'd roped in three former test players. <coughs> <coughs> so we, we duly lost the toss and you know, got sent out to field. And uh, Mike Ram was doing all these TV interviews on the side and you know, eventually after five or ten overs he, he trots out to field. And I'm keeping and Book's standing at first slip and he says to, he comes running over to Book and he says, so where do you want me to field? And Book says, I want you to go over there to square leg. And he looks at Book and he says, where's square leg? So Darren takes him over by the wrist and draws a little mark on the ground and he goes, this is square leg. And so he stood there, didn't move. And a few more overs go by and the Indian batsman at the time was a guy called Chris Shrikant you might have also heard of, you know. He's not a bad batsman. <coughs> Most of the time we were fetching the balls off of the back st you know, steps of the, uh, the fifth deck of the, the stadium. Anyway, eventually Lehman's had enough of this, so he goes over to him and he says, look, see that guy fielding over there at square leg? That's my boss. It'd be really good for my career if you hit him a catch. <laughs> so sure enough, the next ball, Shrikant's hit it straight down the Premier's throat. Anyway, he's put his hands up over his head and it's you know, hit the outside of his hands and fallen on the ground. And these two are laughing, you know, heads off, rolling around in the dust. A few more overs go by and uh, Shrikant, he goes, Book says to Shrikant, do it again. So this time, Rand's closed his eyes. This is a true story. Rand's closed his eyes and he's put his hands up like a girl. No offence intended. <laughs> and you wouldn't believe it, the ball's landed in his hands and you would have think he'd won the World Cup. He's running around, shrieking everywhere and throwing a ball in the air. <laughs> Talk about a B-grade cricket team. But unlike Mike Rand, who of course was actually a POM, when it comes to success, I think us South Australians, and I include myself in this for now, are too limited by our attitudes and our assumptions rather than by thinking about, thinking about things as opportunities. I mean, take the recent Adelaide Oval upgrade, which opened, of course, about 12 months ago and, we, and where we are today. It took 30 years and a little bit of Don Bradman um, you know, disagreement and finally partisan politics to actually pull off what, we, what we're sitting in today. Last year it was 50 years since Donald Horne, who was a journalist who, who became an academic, wrote the book The Lucky Country. I'm sure many of you have heard of it and many more of you, many others have probably read it. Perhaps what's lesser known is the phrase that became the title The Lucky Country is in fact irony. It's the first sentence of the last chapter and of course the full sentence reads, Australia is a lucky country run by second-rate people who share its luck. And the, the really interesting question is 51 years later now, is anything different? That's a whole other story. But here we are trying to sell ourselves as this clever state and we've got all of this new branding that uh, the government talks about, being a clever country and being a clever state. I lived in London for almost five years, as, uh, as Graham said. I was the step state's deputy agent general. And in my five years in London, the two things that struck me most and that were the, the most uh, preoccupation of uh, all of the people that we were trying to encourage to come and live here and invest here were, one, how much Brits and Europeans love Australians for being who we are, and two, what the hell's with the half-hour time zone? So let me give you an example of the first, and I'll come back to the other one in a moment. In fact, it reminds me of a story. Um, when I was in London, and you know, all of my good Australian mates, we used to love the opportunity of getting out and seeing parts of of Europe every weekend, it's not like quite like going to Victor Harbour. You know, we'd go to all of the cities within one hour of, of London. This particular weekend, I was uh, going to, to Denmark, and uh, being two young single blokes, we're always you know looking for a pub, for a, a bar, and uh, a pub with some cold beer. This particular Friday afternoon, we walked into a bar in uh, Copenhagen, and uh, my mate says to me, "Oh, look, I'm going to go over and grab a, you know, quick pit stop on the way. Can you get me a beer when you get to the bar?" I said, "Sure, no worries." I go over to the bar and this beautiful Danish girl comes to, the, to, to serve me and uh, she says, what would you like? I said, oh, just two beers, please. She goes, oh, that's a beautiful accent. Where are you from? I said, oh, I'm Australian. And she said, um, oh, gosh, I love Australia. When I finish university, it's my dream that I can move to Australia and study my master's degree. I said, oh, really, what are you studying? And she said, oh, I'm studying architecture. And, you know, and I said, well, you know, in fact, uh, where I work in London, it's our business to encourage people like you to come to study in Australia. You know, we've got some great universities that offer architecture. And she says, oh, let me get a pen. You can write some of this down for me. So she pulls out a pencil. I said, look, just give me your details and I'll send you some information. So she starts writing down her name and then she writes down her, her email address and then she puts her phone number. And just as she's handing this piece of paper over, my mate walks out of the loo and he's coming back to the bar and he sees this beautiful Danish girl giving me a, 
mobile number. And I said, mate, I've only been here gone three minutes. That must be some kind of record. <laughs> Let's talk about time zones. It's one of my pet annoyances. More than reversible expressways, jokes about Truro and Snowtown, upside down pies in pea soup. I've been writing about this time zone thing, which of course has existed for more than 100 years, for 20 years since I was a cadet journalist and then later an editor at Stock Journal. So imagine my delight two weeks ago when the Premier finally announces that he's going to establish a review into it. Now, you know, personally, I don't care whether we go forward 30 minutes or whether we go back 30 minutes. You know, just get off the half hour. For me, I think the half hour, and, and this is my experience in, in living in London and, and working on you know, inbound state investment, just reinforces this uh, inferiority complex, this geosocial identification that we have as being South Australian by creating another proxy border. If you go back to my original point about you know, what are the three things that define South Australia. So my hypothesis is that the definition of South Australia is no longer relevant, not as it was when, you know, as it once was. We don't have a state bank, you know, we barely have a state football league, we don't have a national electricity grid. The River Murray doesn't care about borders, although, of course, it is the border of New South Wales and Victoria for much of the distance. The Cooper Basin, the Simpson Desert, the Nullarbor Plains, they all ignore these imaginary state lines. I mean, Broken Hills never cared where its time zone is. You can buy Farmer's Union iced coffee in Darwin. You can find Penfolds, as we were talking about, Peter, in Sainsbury in London. In fact, it's one of the cheapest places in the world you can buy it. You just ignore the, the um, air miles. You can queue for, queue for Hague's in George Street in Sydney. You can buy R.M. Williams in the US. You can buy Maggie Beer in Singapore. You can buy Pale Ale in Barcelona. But I'm not suggesting we should get rid of South Australia or the Northern Territory. What I'm suggesting is we shouldn't allow this weird state bias to inhibit and to define our real character and therefore limit our horizons. So I'm from Air Peninsula. I'm from Cleve. So firstly, that makes me a West Coaster, which is, you know, that's what my visa says. Even though my parents still own farming land at Cleve, it's more than 20 years since I lived there. I own a vineyard and a small winery in the Clare Valley where my family originally settled. I sell, Cle I sell, sell, a bit tongue -tied, I sell Clare Valley Shiraz. I don't sell southeastern Australian Shiraz. Thankfully, Penfolds buys it. We have great and powerful regional brands in this state, far more valuable than this South Australian or SA proper noun. Barossa Valley, Kangaroo Island, Linda's Ranges, so Allendale East, down in the southeast, is in South Australia. But so is Anangu, Arkarula, Arno Bay, Adelaide. They're all pretty different. Anangu is closer to Perth than Adelaide. Allendale East is closer to Melbourne than to Adelaide. So secondly, being from Cleve and being Australian, it makes me Australian. It doesn't make me South Australian. And then finally and thirdly, of course I have a birth certificate which has got the little piping shrike on it and it says I was born in South Australia, that jurisdiction that we talked about in the beginning. But I find it really odd how you South Australians define yourselves in the crowd or defend the unique and weird South Australian things like, you know, we invented the stump jump plough, you know, and the hills hoist. You say heat's good, you don't let cars merge in front of you in the left lane. You think Adelaide, because it's the only non-penal colony in Australia, you've got a British accent? It's just weird. And yes, that was the third person. So as a political jurisdiction, South Australia and the Northern Territory has a state or national relevance in those areas, of course. But if we allow state borders to continue to define our economic, our environmental, our social aspirations, it really does limit our, our, our concepts and our, uh, and our ability to uh, these imaginary lines, like the one appropriately named border town, or the line just east of the appropriately named border town. So if I'm answering the question that I propose in my title, is South Australia a three-letter acronym? No, it's two words, a proper noun. But it doesn't matter. Who cares about NSW or QLD? We should live like state borders don't exist. Rupert Murdoch, Leighton Hewitt, Sear, William Bragg, Adam Scott, Jeffrey Smart, Andy Thomas, I mean, they didn't really care. They weren't limited to you know, their, their scope by just being uh, South Australian. So in concluding, I challenge you to, to look outside, not inside, to look up and not down, and to move forwards, not backwards, half an hour. Thank you.
I'm sure uh, Stephen is um, happy to take some questions. Do you have some questions? Uh, David Ruder, sorry. <laughs> one, 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 one of those days, isn't it? No. Um, anyway, um, any questions? Steve. It is a good question. Um, in fact, I wrote to the Premier two and a, the question was, uh, do I support going forward half an hour or back half an hour? Uh, in fact, I wrote to the, the Premier wrote to chief executives about two and a half years ago looking for ideas and I sent him, a, having sent him many briefings when I worked in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, this time I wrote him a simple letter and I made it an open letter and I sent it to the Australian and the Advertiser and a bunch of TV stations and I said, well, here's an easy one, just get off the half hour. And uh, you know, it was quite widely reported two and a half years ago. And the two most vocal opponents was one, my dad, who lives on Air Peninsula still, and, uh, and two, our neighbour, a guy called Peter Dunn, who was the head of the Legislative Council, when the last time this came up, 20 years ago, when Jay Weatherall's father was in the House of, in the Leg Council. Personally, I'd go forward half an hour and just be done with it. Other questions? I have two thoughts on it. One, I think it's good. I mean, growing up on a farm, my, I'm one of five children and my father was a farmer and my grandfather and his father and my great-great-grandfather, so I'm the first not to. My dad pushed us off, almost literally. He said, you know, you, you need to go away and get a qualification and then you need to go out and see the world and get some experience. He said, and then if you want to come home and be a farmer, then you can. It worked so well that none of us have gone home, so we've leased all the farms, but that's another story. So I think... I think the, the, the opportunity to go away internationally and gain some experience is incredibly value and has much more upside than downside. The point is, can we get people home? Can we get people back? And the only way that we're going to do that is if they've got jobs and careers. I mean, lifestyle to die for, but where are the opportunities? You know, where is the jobs? Which is, I think, you know, one of the things that this Royal Commission into the uranium and nuclear situation, and we've done a pretty major paper on this uh, at UCL looking at the economics, Unfortunately, it's not a public document, um, but they're pretty staggering potentials. There's no, there's no uh, enrichment capacity in our opinion. There's no uh, nuclear power demand because of falling capacity in Australia. But you know, the opportunity to get into a highly technical area of, of uh, advanced manufacturing is incredibly in interesting. And so that's the biggest limitation is there's not really good jobs here, careers. I haven't gone quite that far. I mean, I think there are certainly issues with the structure of the Senate, but, you know, how long have we got? <laughs> I mean, we've got, we've got an upper house in Canberra that's got equal membership, and the population distribution that's occurred since 1901 has been substantial. Um, and, of course, we've got, you know, a, a misrepresentation of, of, the, of those percentages now, but that's a long story. Any other questions? Sure. Well, I guess I'll uh, I know, I understand it quite well. I was I, I wrote it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I can give you uh, two simple answers. I mean, the, the Carnegie Mellon element is really opening up uh, opportunities for students in Australia to study in Pittsburgh now. I mean, it's very much a dual hemisphere model. In terms of the UCL experience, um, there's very little state government money involved. Most of it was industry. Um, 80% of it was industry funding. Um, and the reason that, the, that UCL has decided not to 
to continue has nothing to do with the state. It's a, a decision that the university made. Um, simple. Simple to ex to explain, hard to understand. <laughs> well, I mean, one last question, please. And then go. Indeed. Well, in fact, the Antarctic's drier than South Australia, <laughs> so we're not actually the driest state in the dry we're in the driest inhabited <laughs> continent, perhaps. Um, I, d I don't know. I think it's uh, I think it's much more uh, much more significant than you know some climatic condition. I think you know we've we've got this uh, inferiority complex that's been around for a long period of time, and uh, we've got to get over it. Um, we've got to become. Uh, you know, in charge of our own destiny, instead of accepting a dollar thirty in the dollar from GST revenues, start to actually stop complaining about it and do something productive and proactive, take control of our own destiny. Okay, thank you, um, David. Um, what um, David's comments about the state border reminded me of an experience I had at Santos many years ago, when uh, there's a geological um, feature in the Kuiper Basin called the Nathanmeri Trough, which has had quite a lot of recent interest. But we had, I'd, we, had we, we put together a presentation with a map of the um, Nathanmeri Trough in the Cooper Basin, and I um, went and extended the Nathanmeri Trough into Queensland, which I got into trouble for because we had to change it back, so we stopped it um, on, the, on the border, really. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you very much. Thank you. Good, and um, take this as a token of appreciation. If you can join me in thanking David. <laughs>